that I can look in one direction, but it's really helpful if there's someone stood next to me looking in another one. And because between us, we've then got both the sources of information we need. So I think you've got to get out of your own way and get over your own ego and realize that it takes a lot of different areas of expertise to create something that's really compelling and can really move the dial. You're listening to Lights, Camera, Crypto, the podcast exploring all things entertainment and Web3. I'm your host, Stephen Ladden, and this week our guest is Gala Music and Gala Film CEO, Sarah Buxton, who goes by Bucks. In this episode, Bucks discusses how her entrepreneurial and renegade spirit led her to leading the team at Gala Music and Gala Film, a next generation platform that brings an enhanced experience to listeners, viewers, fans, and artists. She also talks about the future of Web3, how surrounding herself with different viewpoints has been a key to her success, and how embracing failure can actually lead to an increase in innovation. Let's dive in. Sarah, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. And it's delightful to be here. Thank you for having me. My pleasure and delightful to have you. Growing up, did you always have a fascination with technology or media? How did your early life lay the groundwork for where you are now? I don't think it was as specific as a tech. When I was growing up, oh my goodness, I'm going to make myself sound old. It was before, so I'm 40, right? Which is like ancient in this space. And I'm a woman as well. So it's a bit of a weird combination. A lot of the things that people are growing up with now weren't around. And so what's interesting is I think I've always had this drive towards a life less ordinary about doing things that not everybody else would do. I never, even as a kid, I was always in, like when I was in school, like creating new businesses, coming up with ideas. Um, I was pitching banks for loans at 18 years old with my like decks and like these, these big sort of dreams I had. I never wanted to just go into what I saw was the rat race. I had a very humble upbringing and there wasn't always a lot of money in the house. And I remember my parents working incredibly hard and all of the sort of sacrifices you make for that, you don't get to go on the holidays and all of that kind of stuff because life wasn't easy and you had to have a good work ethic. So I always knew that you could do anything. You just had to work maybe harder than the next person, but definitely hard. And so I think it was more a mentality than maybe a fascination that kind of led me into the weird, <laughs> wonderful role that I find myself in today. But I had a lot of a lot of fun and unique and challenging experiences on the way here, that's for sure. And it, and it sounds like part of those experiences were helped or aided or guided by an innate entrepreneurial spirit that was ushering you on a path to find and create opportunities for yourself yeah I think so I think it's weird in the in the UK you don't really talk about entrepreneurs and entrepreneurialism because it's seen a for something for rich people that can afford to take risks and be a little bit arrogant because in mm. the UK we are a little bit we're a little bit less positive and optimistic I think than in the US I think we do have this kind of attitude of what if it fails Rather than in the US, I see the opposite, which is what if it succeeds and people right. are willing to have a go. So that's quite an unusual thing. And I think you have to have a support network around you of people telling you that just go for it. And again, that's quite unusual. A lot of people, particularly when you care about someone, where, and especially your child, and I can relate to that, is that you want to protect them and you want them to do the right thing and you want them to be safe and you want all of these things for them. And that's not necessarily endorsing them going out and doing something that's highly risky, highly leveraged and highly unusual. Those things freak parents out. So I think it's it's interesting when you find your people. And I think what I get to do now is quite nice because being part of a platform, you're allowing people with those dreams to have a shot at making it. You can't do it for them, but you can certainly be in their corner and cheer for them a little bit. And I think that's a really nice thing, actually. Totally. And especially coming from, it sounds like the environment in which that wasn't the necessarily the norm and allowing a space to be created for others to have that opportunity in perhaps in a little more accessible way is definitely sounds really meaningful. 
Yeah, it is. It's and it's one of those things that you can get caught up in the ideology ideology of it a little bit and think, oh, we're going to do all of this wonderful things. And but you do have to reconcile that with it has to be commercially successful because otherwise you're a charity. And we know how hard or most people know how hard it is to raise money for charities and misappropriation of funds and politics and all of that, like just rubbish that gets put into to all of those situations. So you have to have a really solid business. And I think that's why it's such a lovely combination is that I am really good at failing. And I'm really good at when I fail of getting up, dusting myself off and going, okay, let's have another go at that. And once you've done that for 20 years across huge corporations and startups, and you've invested money and you've lost money and you've tried and you failed and you've tried again, you figure out what you need to do to make it work. And a lot of it's the people that you bring and put around you because nobody can succeed alone. And I think once you've got that commercial pattern down and it becomes more than rhetoric or ideology, that's when you can then look to a bigger purpose and a bigger picture because you do that with a lot of entrepreneurs, right? They get to the, they almost want to even out their karma. They get to the top of an organization and then they start doing all these altruistic things. And that's nice, but I would rather do something where I'm building something that makes a lot of sense for the people involved. And as a result of that, other people get to benefit as well. So I think there is a triple win scenario. And that's certainly what I'm looking for. A company, community, and the content provider as well. And is that one of the main drivers as to why you chose to embark on the career with Gala? Yeah, yes and no. Gala is a really strange beast. So I was one of the original team, I suppose you could say. We, there were less than 20 of us when I joined Gala. I joined as the COO. We were very small. We had Frankenstein's child in the form of Townstar at the time. Nobody else was really doing that much when I joined in the space. It was very early, early days. It was when you could get a Beeple for 40 bucks. It was that kind of stage. And Gala grew incredibly fast, made a lot of mistakes, fell over a lot of times, but the fundamental core of Gala was really strong. And the person that founded it and championed it it was Eric Schirmer, who was the one of the co-founders of Zynga and before that MySpace. So it had this really amazing sort of wrapper around it. And in all honesty, I was just fascinated because I had never had a job before. I've always been independent. I've always been an entrepreneur. I've been a gun for hire and I've worked with a lot of big brands. And I never accepted an employment contract because I never wanted to be restricted. And a lot of my power was that I could go from different companies and take my learnings and put it into a new situation. And the fact that I was there for a short period of time meant my time there was a lot more impactful and I could have those conversations with people in the C-suite and move those agendas forward. But Gala offered me something which I found fascinating and that was the concept of, and I like blockchain and I've spent a lot of time in blockchain, but much, I would say, with more straight lace industries. So lots of finance, things like retirement, savings, protecting people's wealth as they got older and those kind of things. And it was very boring. <laughs> and I don't mean that in a mean way, but it's not something you get out of bed in the morning and go, oh my goodness, we're changing the world. It was important and it mattered and making sure people have comfortable lives or better lives than they had is obviously a good thing to do. But I hadn't been involved in gaming and the idea that this was a way that you could inject this technology into the masses without almost them knowing and that they could benefit from that. I found that fascinating. And I love the fact that at the time it was very much centered around lifting people up, giving them ownership and control. And I was like, this feels like home. This feels like a job I could actually do. And building the team from an embryonic 20 people up in an American culture, fully remote with some crazy people and a crazy vision and unknown technology, I was like, yeah, this feels, this feels like a big enough challenge. I'm in. And that's how it started really. And that was, yeah, over what, two and a half years ago now, a long time. Wow. And I love how when you're recounting this, that it really, from your initial point of impact and something that's a little more renegade, has those elements and the ability to 
infuse, as you mentioned, the tech, there it's like a snowball of all these different factors that were important to you balled up into one role. Yeah, that that's exactly it. And I think it's for me, it's always I want I want to work with people that don't think like me. I find that the most fascinating thing because I think as adults, we just presume we know everything or it's too hard to question ourselves because that means we somehow inadequate or we failed or we were wrong in the first place. And I really, I saw that in a lot of the big corporations I work for, you got this sort of board of people that had been there for a long time. And it was a mixture of arrogance and fear and complacency that they didn't really want to change it. It was working. The shareholders got their dividends and it just meant that the whole thing needed to be disrupted because they couldn't be asked to do it for whatever reason, personal agenda, legacy systems. And I think when you come across something like Gala and it's all to play for and it's an open book and an open field and it needs defining from the start, that's really exciting. And it brings together groups of people that don't normally speak, that don't normally get in a room together. And I came from very much, I'm obviously I'm a Brit and we have a certain work culture and I had to get through a lot of that because they thought the Europeans and the British were lazy. And I remember having a conversation with our CEO and he's, oh my goodness, the UK team are phenomenal. And I said, you do realize why we're perceived as so good. And he didn't say anything. I was like, we do double days, right? Like we're eight hours behind you. And we've normally done eight hours before you're online and then we carry on. So we're doing, if you believe in something and you want something to work, you put in the hours, right? Because someone somewhere out there is doing exactly that. And if you want to be the ones that are at the front, you need to do exactly the same and probably more. So yeah, there's, there was a whole bunch of reasons, but I think that idea of working with people I wouldn't normally come across and gamers, like that's a whole, that's a whole different ballpark. Like, Working with, I've worked with developers an awful lot, building products and shipping products, but game designers, you really are like bringing up their children. And it's quite funny. They're much more emotional than some of the other developers I've worked with. So that's always fun. Like the storytelling side of it, I think is fascinating. Yeah. And I really appreciate and enjoy hearing you say that putting yourself in environments and working with people that you normally wouldn't work with is was also a big driver because how else as individuals and as a company and products how else is growth possible that's really the true catalyst and what you were saying where systems that were in place that were working but albeit might have been a bit stagnant it's there needs to be an injection of some sort of shakeup in order to prompt new innovations. Otherwise, you're just going to keep getting the same feedback loop. You are. And I think what also happens, it's so funny because it works both ways, right? When you're, when you're young and impulsive, you come into these companies and you think you know everything, but you don't because you haven't failed enough and you haven't experienced everything. But when you're older, you think that you know everything because you've been here and you've done it. But what you fail to recognize is the world changes every single day. And what was right even a week ago isn't necessarily right anymore. It's not necessarily the best way forward. So you need these, you need different inputs. So even from a generational point of view, the younger people coming in need the battle-hardened warriors that have been there, but the battle-hardened warriors need these young pretenders and challengers to come in and do what they do. And if you don't have a mix of both, you can't possibly make it because you can't see all the different angles. And I guess that's where I come from is I can look in one direction, but it's really helpful if there's someone stood next to me looking in another one. And because between mm. us, we've then got both the sources of information we need. So I think you've got to get out of your own way and get over your own ego and realize that it takes a lot of different areas of expertise to create something that's really compelling and can really move the dial. And how have those different perspectives aided the mission and the work that you guys are doing at Gala? It's a good question. I think channeling people's different ideologies is tough in a brand new space because I think there's there are some fundamental mismatches between what people perceive success to be. And that's always difficult. 
I think I'm running Gala Gala Music. I moved over as CEO of, of Entertainment. The games business is huge and needs a lot of eyes on it and a lot of arms around it. And to be honest, I think I will always move where I'm going to have the most impact, both personally, I think it's nice to feel fulfilled, but I think also for the business. And I think the games business was at a stage where you have to make a choice. It's like, you can't do all of this. So if you want to go over and do entertainment, go and run entertainment or stay here and we'll let someone else do that. You can do anything, but you can't do everything is the classic. So I'll talk more to music right now because that's top of my mind. We're doing lots with film as well. But I think what I'm really enjoying, we've got a very solid leadership team and they're young being developed right now. But I love watching the tension between the economists who are trying to achieve one thing and then the marketeers and the user experience people who want to give away and achieve something else versus the engineers who come at it so pragmatically. And I think it's just, we were on a call today and it's fascinating. And we've got the finance guy and then you've got the operations person and then you've got the artist champion. And we've all got slightly different agendas, but I think what's really nice about the music vision and proposition is that we are all aiming in the same direction at least so we might have arguments as to how to climb the mountain but we know which mountain we're climbing which i suppose is a vast majority of the challenge sure and it sounds like though you have it, it sounds like a very open and diverse ecosystem within internally whereby you have all these different levers or perspectives as we're truly calling them and if all of the overarching drive is in the same direction, like you said, then it seems like that's the best place to be with a variety of different, everybody's working toward the same goal from different angles. And then you have the best possible solution, I think, to whatever problems you guys tackle as a team. Yeah, I, I would say that's absolutely true. And I think it is really challenging and you hear about sort of, corporate awfulness every day and I think the balance I find probably most tricky is that of what does good leadership look like it's the I'll dive in with a team and I'll write the emails and I'll do the sales calls and I'll, I'll be in the discord but you then have to temper that with is that like undermining or overruling someone else so it, there's this really difficult balance between being firm and being fair and being friendly and being open, right? And like knowing how to create psychological safety in an organization, but at the same mm. time, not allowing lethargy or some people to coast at the expense of others. There's a whole range of, there's the skill side of it, there's the energy and effort side of it, but then there's the sort of the people management side of it. And that's what people forget. Like businesses are made up of human beings that are in their heads 100% of the time thinking, worrying. And when you work remotely and you've got different cultures, different ages, different skill sets, different backgrounds, different levels of sensitivity about different things, it is challenging to get everybody working together. And you really do need to, because what is it? Nine out of 10 startups fail and they don't necessarily fail because their product's crappy. They fail because they can't get it together in the right way. So sure. I think product's half of it, but people is a huge part of it that should not be underestimated. And we're really guilty of that. In Web3, we take an awful lot of time talking about promotion and product, but we very rarely focus on what big businesses and normie companies do, which is on their people, because it's your biggest cost, it's your biggest asset, and it's your biggest differentiator. And if you don't get it right, you're pretty much dead before you start once you burn through that VC funding, which incidentally, Gala Music doesn't have any of that. Thank goodness. <laughs> wow. Wow. And it sounds like too, then you are uniquely positioned given your background and your enthusiasm for putting yourself in situations where you know, you'll be challenged because that's what you're describing here, being immersed and surrounded by different perspectives, different personalities, different factors and influences within those different people and personalities. And if that's your, if that's where you feel comfortable, then it sounds like you're well poised to, you know, guide that ship. Yeah, I'm, 
I hope so. And when I'm not, I won't do it. And I think the team and the community particularly will be honest with me with that. And I think you have to accept that there's always someone stronger, faster, better, younger, older, more qualified than you will be, right? So whilst you're the best person for the job, you should do the job. But I think you have to have the humility to know where you're best suited. But I absolutely believe a championship team wins, not a team of champions. And that's something I will keep pushing. I don't like showboats. I don't like me. I like we, us, our. That's always going to be my way. Because even when you get the sort of the poster child CEOs, they're not the ones doing it. They're possibly amazing leaders. They're possibly amazing visionaries. They're possibly amazing at lots of different things but they're not doing it on their own. And so it's the people that are able to move people, to tell the best stories, to get people inspired, to make people feel like they're not just on a hamster wheel because we all work really hard and digital lives are a thing and we can work from any beach, any mountaintop, any ocean. So how do you segment that and how do you make it feel meaningful? And I'm hoping with that's what Web3 can do, which is It's not just about a return for shareholders. You're doing something so fundamental that can actually change an industry. And we're tackling music in this example. And I believe for the first time in a long time that there can be a fundamental shift in how we treat and support and find and benefit from talent. And it's Mm. not streaming for 9.99 or 10.99 a month in a commoditized way i think we can do something much more exciting and human and i think that's a big goal to to run after and everybody can make some money in the process including the artists which is nice and what do you think that looks like tangibly so tangibly gala music it's a system where artists can come in There's different levels that they can come in at, depending how many fans they've got, what track record they've got, and they can sell their music. You don't have to buy their music. You can stream music for free on Gala Music as well. But you can buy that artist track as an NFT. I know NFT is a difficult set of letters these days, but it's an underlying technology that's important in this case. And by owning that track, every time that musician has people listening to that song, you earn rewards for that. The artist has already been paid by you buying those tracks. The listener is looked after as well because we can track listens. So for once, artists know who their fans are and they get things like merchandise and early access and then actual track owners. So the person that went out and bought the track, they get actual sort of token rewards and those tokens can be spent in store on, you can't access, money can't access experiences. So There's basically a new creator economy being built around this industry that's been closed for so long that 85% of its value now belongs on streaming platforms. I think it's an interesting shift where the artist gets paid, the artist has control, the artist holds their own rights. They don't need to give up any of their rights to their songs or anything like that. The listener is able to benefit. They can come and rather than on a normal streaming platform where you just listen and that's it, you listen. And as a result of listening to so many tracks over so much time, you're able to get incentives and perks and recognition for that. And the people that come in and buy those tracks are able to share in the rewards. And if an artist does very well, they get more rewards. So you're actually part and parcel of their success and future because on the Gala Music platform, In typical Web3 style, we're not a walled garden. We count plays on other digital streaming platforms as well. So it doesn't matter if the artist blows up on our platform or on a more traditional platform. As a track owner, you would get the benefit of that because we're counting those listens as well. That's a sort of an example of how the music ecosystem is working to the benefit of everybody that participates in it. And it sounds like it's definitely helping to create that experience for both the artist and fans and that engagement around those two entities in a way that's more immersive in a way that's more interactive than perhaps previously yeah i think that's the thing that people love isn't it drake can just be talking to someone and if he does it on instagram live he'll get twenty-five thousand views because it's the 
you, you want to be part of this. We're human. We want to, we want the connection. We want to be part of the story. They're talking about Taylor Swift. He's literally supporting the economy as she goes around on her tour and hotels are filling up. So for an actual music fan to have that chance where you can jump on a video call with an artist, to have that chance where you can get bespoke merchandise, to have that chance where you can get behind the scenes passes or you can have Snoop jumps into our Discord and has a chat with people. It's those kind of things that, and there's always going to be a balance, right? Like the magic of an artist is that they're a little bit of a step removed. They are a brand, but that doesn't mean they have to be completely inaccessible. And a lot of artists, people are quite dismissive of it. They don't want to be near their fans. That would be a disaster. And I said, yeah, not wanting to be hassled and harangued by fans is one thing, but literally having no idea who comes to your concerts or who buys your tickets, or who, you know, is following you around the world and listening to your music and spending this money on you. That's crazy. And at the minute, they don't have that data. They can't access that data because that data is very powerful for third parties, selling events, selling tickets, and all those kind of things. So giving the artists that visibility gives the artist a choice, and they can reward their mega fans with whatever they want. And then the mega fans are benefiting from a, a deeper, more personalized relationship with somebody that they really are invested in. And I think it's quite nice being feeling like you're part of that, particularly with the early stage artists that you do genuinely feel invested in their future. And I think that's cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. And for an artist too, as you mentioned, that data being super powerful, that's, they have a real life passionate R&D group at their yeah. fingertips. And, it, and it's like, how awesome can, is it that fans can both provide the insights to help the artist provide it, it's like them having control allows that cyclical nature of the relationship to exist on a more meaningful in a more meaningful way i love that you just said that steve i think i think that's so true and i'm smiling because not that you can see because it's a podcast but a couple of hours ago we did a community table and that's the other thing that's really interesting about this space. And it's been given a bad name because there's a lot of people that made a lot of money by doing a lot of bizarre, unscrupulous and pretty, pretty pokey things, really. But we're building a business and as are many in the space, in actual fact. But we are building a business out in the complete open. And that can be utterly terrifying. But the days that you show up are the days where it's not going well, not the days where you want to go into the community and have a high five. And you're absolutely right about that feedback loop and about that sort of test group, because we've got that in our community. Like in the old days, like in the corporations I used to work for and get hired into to solve problems for, we used to say, thousands like thousands and thousands to do focus groups and feedback and anonymous and all this rubbish we can literally like right now i can hop into discord and our customer base our community are right there and they will tell you exactly how they feel and so this idea of being able to we're developing an app and to be able to sit with them tonight and to show a group of them that I trust very much, and they're not even under NDA because I trust them that much, and to showcase the app to them, for them to be able to feed back and tell us their thoughts, that is incredibly powerful. And that's why these companies in this sort of new wave of technology, if we do it right, if we stay and we mind our morals, we can't not win because we've got all of the bits that are required to get this right. We've got everything we need at our fingertips. And I was talking to the tech team the other day and I, they were talking about something they wanted to deploy and why they wanted to deploy it. And I said, that it's great guys, it's really great. And we've got amazingly talented people. I was like, but you do need to think of this like a game of chess and you're one of the pieces. So say you're the rook, right? You've also got a knight that you can play with and a bishop and all of these other pawns on the board. And if you don't figure out how you play them all together, you will never win the game of chess because it's all sporadic and it's all the threads don't work and you don't have an overall strategy. And so that's what I think a lot of these young blossoming companies, a lot of founders that haven't run businesses before, once they get their heads around that, that you're playing 4D chess and you don't just think about the next drop, the next release, the next sale the next community announcement, you're thinking eight steps ahead and you're thinking 
How do I utilize a small, nimble team in the right and best possible way to get the piece in checkmate, right? Because that's the game that you're playing and all of these different strategies coming together. And if you look at it that way, you realize it is a complicated puzzle, but it's not unwinnable. It's really not because we've got all the pieces and I don't think the Web2 companies have yet. They'll get there, but at the minute, we've got a head start. Do you think that at a certain point, the Web3 world and the Web2 world will, will converge and there won't be, it will just be the future of the internet. It wouldn't necessarily be the designation between Web3 and Web2. And then we'll find ourselves in a new plateau until the next iteration of things. Yeah, I think, look, for 95% of the population, it already is. They don't talk about Web2 companies and Web3 companies. They don't talk about any of this stuff. Like it's just a business that, or a website or a product and you want it or you don't. And I think we almost need to get over our own jargon and our own way of thinking about it because we're the blockers, because you're absolutely right. LVMH, they don't care about Web2 and Web3. They're going to they're gonna do the moves that they're going to do and as part of their company strategy and use the technology that makes sense to them. And they'll find their niches in their different customer bases and different regions based on that. And I think we all need to take that view. And with Gala Music, it's got to be just Gala Music. It's not Web3 Entertainment or blockchain this or NFTs that. It's just Gala music and I come and I can go to a listening party on this app. And if I do that, I get to earn this. And if I earn this, I unlock that. And oh, that's cool. They don't care what's underneath it. They don't need me quoting that it's run by 25,000 nodes. It's like the right, nodes right. care. Nobody else gives monkeys, like literally not bothered. So yeah, I think it's whether it converges or not, it's a perception really rather than a, than a roadmap thing, I think. For sure. And part of that perception, though, is I think when you say it's a barrier to entry in that a year ago, having a wallet to access a thing, it was a much more, perhaps for the average person, complicated layer to access some of the things we're talking about that now there's a little more, because the technology changes so rapidly, Those there's a little more ease of accessibility than there was previously. So you know, yeah, we can breadcrumb it a bit more now. Do you remember what it was like trying to buy Bitcoin when it first came out? Oh my good insane. lord! Yeah. yeah, it was absolutely three, three like, step process. Was, yeah, oh, but it like even the identification and stuff. It was insane. Like early days of Bitcoin, like nuts. But you're absolutely right. The the underlying technology, the underlying trustless nature of what we're doing, the tokenized nature of what we're doing. The more you can ease people into that without talking seed phrases and wallets and cold storage and all of the other things, I think is really, it, it's a no brainer. And I think what Gala Music is doing, and I know many companies are doing it now, we even just start people where we drop things into their vault. So until they're ready to set up their wallet, until they want to put it on chain and they want to move it into ETH and to do some trading with it, they don't need to, they still own it, but they don't actually have to go through those steps. So you can delay some of that. I think credit card payments have really helped as well, because you don't need to go into, you really want this thing, but I'm not really sure what all of these different altcoins are and how I get them and what I do with it and exchanges and all the other things. So I think we're, we're getting there and we're simplifying it. There's still a long way to go with that. And the juice has got to be worth the squeeze. And I think that's where the space has fallen down a bit. I think from a, a digital art point of view, it's revolutionary. Beyond that, there were a lot of promises made and a lot of damp squibs, like all these games that weren't really games. They were click and collect and mm -hmm. it was like a grind. But the difference is if, if you're grinding in Minecraft or something, you were having fun or another game, you're having fun, but this game isn't fun. I think we've got to get the experience has got to be worth the effort to access it as well. And that's something that obviously we've all got to work out in the space collectively, for sure. Just want to bring it back for a second. You mentioned how failure, you failed a bunch and how impactful that was on your career in general. How has failure inspired you to take the steps that you've taken throughout your career and in particular with Gala? Yeah, so fa failure hasn't inspired me. I would love to say it has, but that would feel really contrived. 
failure is hard and failure sucks and failure makes you doubt yourself but failure also makes you brave it makes you hard it makes you persevere and it makes you just you're gonna have to knock me pretty hard for me to stay down because I've got stronger over time so I think that's what failure's done it it made me it made me resilient it made me a little bit I, I don't buy my own bullshit I'm a pretty good salesperson and you never believe your own story so I think for me, it's less about fail, fail fast, yeah, but sometimes I fail slow because you believe you're, you're doing the right thing and it takes a while to figure out that, okay, that's not the right thing and that's not going to work. So yeah, it makes you your own, it makes you your own worst critic and I think that's a really good thing. And I think you learn, if you don't learn from your mistakes, you're not learning anything, right? And then with Gala, I think what that, I hope what it does is it means you forgive failure in others as well. Because I would rather somebody step up and take a swing than just sit in the clubhouse and not try. And for me, if you are in my team and you step up and you take a swing and you miss, I'm going to be right there behind you having another swing with you. And that's, I think we have to do that. You have to let people have a go at this because, and I say it to the team a lot, Nobody knows what they're doing. They've got an inkling, but I think once you believe you know what you're doing, you're on a road to ruin. So we're all making it up, particularly Mm -hmm. in a space that's unknown. And all we can do, like I said at the beginning, is bring a lot of different skills together so that hopefully between you, you've got a formula that works, that you can keep playing with and adapting until you finally figure out what the perfect blend is. And that's all you can really ask for from anybody. And the perfect blend, unfortunately, in two years time will be different again. So you never have to stop tinkering, basically. And you phrased it, forgive failure. I almost wonder though, if what you're really saying is accepting failure in others, because if your team is encouraged to fail, then not, not that you want the failure to be the result, but if that's, if there is that safe space to fail, then I'm much more liberated to, okay, hey, I'm going to try these ideas and I have a scratchy itch that, oh, this might just work. And then you're more ardent to pursue those things that you might have otherwise held off from because of your of Yeah, I I love that. I love that. I think you're right. And I think it's good if experiments fail and people don't. And so we've got this obsession, consultant by, by trade in many ways, of a DIB framework. And DIB stands for data, insight, belief, and bet. And so you take, particularly in live products, it's much easier, but you can, if you're building a product from scratch, there's always data out there that you can surface, particularly now, behaviors, trends, all that kind of stuff. And so what you do from that is you can prioritize, you can say, this is the data, this is the insight that's derived from that data so that, you know, this is happening, meaning the customers are doing this. Okay. And then it's, what's the belief? Why do you think that's happening? And then based on your belief, you place a bet. And what's Mm. quite nice about that system is that then it's just an experiment. And so it's not Steve's brilliant idea, it's, or Steve's bad idea, it's Steve spotted some data and an insight that thought was really interesting and that would help what we're trying to do, believe this and took a bet that this was what was going to happen if this belief was proven to be correct and is now going to invest. And then what's lovely is you can say, all right, we're going to put, I don't know, $2,000 on this bet and see what happens. And then whatever happens, if the bet comes off, great. You've just found a new way forward based on data and insight. And if it doesn't, you've got a learning to add into your next experiment. And so if you run it like that, experiments can fail every single day. That's great because when one of them works, you've cracked the nut, right? And that's in that perfect. way, it's like science in a way. Exactly. And so it's less about subjective, theoretical, my opinion versus your opinion, my gut instinct versus your gut instinct or your expertise, because you've been doing this 20 years and I've been doing it two minutes. Remove all of that bullshit and just say, OK, yeah, but what does the data tell us? What does that mean for what we're looking at today? And I can place a bet just like you can. And we can then prioritize those and decide based on the outcome where we go next. And then you're learning together, you're failing together, but you're not really failing because it's just the experiment that failed. And in the end, it's propelling everything that you as the individual and the team is working on collectively forward in some way, whether that's incrementally or a few 
yards ahead. Exactly. And I think one of the biggest failings that I used to see from these wildly, from the outside looking in successful organizations that were big, it was bizarre. You would put their board of directors as we would have in the UK or their executive committee in the US into a room. And if you split them up and you talk to them and you ask them what their goals were of the company, they would all say something different. And that's, I think, another thing that, you know, as a, whether you're an entrepreneur or a corporate, and there's nothing wrong with not being an entrepreneur. You can still have a, an entrepreneurial mindset in a corporation without owning your own. But you really do have to have that understanding amongst particularly the leadership team, what the goals you're after actually are, because otherwise, even in that example of experimenting, you're not really trying to get to the same place because it's so nuanced that you're all pulling in slight, you feel like you're going the same direction, but it's all slightly different. And then rather than running a race next to each other, you're running a three-legged race where you, there's loads of energy, but it's not quite working and you don't really know why, because in theory, you're both trying to go in the same direction and it just feels a little awkward. So I think being really clear around those goals is so important because I think alignment breeds autonomy. Totally. Without alignment, you just have chaos. In terms of those goals and in terms of what we can expect next, what can we expect to see from Gala Music, from the entertainment division? What's on the horizon? What are you excited about that, that you can talk about? What, what should we be on the lookout for? Oh, there's so much. We are on the rise for sure. So we've, we've got a really lovely partnership that's being rolled out little by little with Live Nations. That's really cool. Over the summer, you'll see more of the outcome of that. Uh, we've done a deal with a very large label, still sticking to what we believe with emerging artists and collaborating with them because I think they're interested in the space and we're in a good position to experiment with. So that that's great. We're obviously, not obviously, but we're moving towards our token launch. And that's an interesting one because... We are doing something that's very novel with the design of that, because I don't know a single altcoin. And if you remove Bitcoin and Ethereum from the conversation that I would herald as a success. And so I'm not entirely sure why I would advocate repeating what everybody else in the space has done. So I think we, I would like a business that's here in 20 years time and is flourishing and an ecosystem that benefits all the people participating in it that isn't a Ponzi scheme, I think that would be great. So we're working very closely with all of the people that are relevant for that as well. So I think for us, the next, the next probably even 12 months, it's around, it's the scalable proposition. It's the apps launching, more artists coming in, bigger artists to help bring those fan bases over. And then to inject some of the games mentality into the business as well. Music as an experience doesn't just need to be audio or indeed visual. There's other elements you can add in there to make it more engaging and more fun beyond just the listen part of it, which is obviously amazing. Supporting the live music experience is one thing, but I think there's a gamification element that's really exciting that we can tap into as well. Knowing and understanding, having been at Gala Games, some of the mentality around those gamers and the kind of interactions they enjoy as well. There's a huge amount on the horizon for Gala Music, and I'm excited to see more of the artists on big festival stages, more names coming into the space and more fans discovering that you can actually have a more rewarding experience than just not paying very much for music and be closer to artists and discover new content and be rewarded and be part of the music journey of these sort of emerging talents as well. Yeah, it's huge. There's a lot to, there's a lot to run at. And then films launching too. So we launched three trailers at Comic-Con last weekend. We're working with some amazing talents over there as well on a very similar premise of independence and unlocking different levels of creativity because of having these sort of smart contracts and blockchain and all the token token gated elements as well that can lead to sort of new content experiences so there's a ton on the agenda i'm getting quite tired just thinking about it <laughs> <laughs> it's good you just got to break it up into bite-sized chunks that's the key i think Absolutely. Absolutely. And if I'm a fan or an artist and I want to get involved, how do I find Gala? So Gala is easy to find these days. To find Gala itself, you go to gala.com because we've got that one. That's nice and simple. 
Gala music is music.gala.com and you literally don't need to do anything. You can come as a listener, sign up, and then you can listen for free and you can start to explore the platform and enjoy that community. As with most Web3 projects, although all businesses, platforms, we're on Discord and the team do hop in there a lot. I'm in Discord a lot as well. So there's always a community to rally around you. And I think even the news of Snaid O'Connor and, and some of the stuff, the art that came out earlier this week, I think there is a lot to be said around finding your people and finding communities and some commonality and camaraderie. And I think that's something that Gala, but as beyond Gala, lots of companies in Web3 are really trying to promote that we've always had this sort of community focused rhetoric. And I think it's really important that's not just about wagging me and trying to make money on the way up, but actually it's about seeing humans for who they are and saying, look, you might be having some trouble and some stuff going on in your life, but actually there's these communities that you can really dive into and lose yourself in a nice way and find people that are willing to chat and have some banter with you. And Gala Music, I hope, is one of those environments too that just come and hang out, listen to some music. You can get involved however you want. And if you want to end up, you know, buying a track and supporting an artist and going on that journey, you can. Yeah, I think that's it really. Just, yeah, being a place for everyone, I think is important. All inclusive. Bucks, I appreciate the conversation. I appreciate the deeper dive into your trajectory and the ethos and values that motivate you as an individual and collectively with your group and excited to see what you guys come up with in the coming months. Thank you so much, Steve. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to another episode of Lights, Camera, Crypto, a podcast produced by Matt Bogart and Essential Media. Music by Brian Duncan and Kareem Imes. If you enjoyed this experience, be sure to rate and subscribe to our show and to follow at Sladen and at Decentral Media for additional content.